Good afternoon to all of you. Minister, ladies and gentlemen, a few days ago, NATO hosted a meeting with our 30 allied ministers of defense and our invitees, Finland and Sweden. And while they discussed additional steps to strengthen our resilience and protect critical infrastructure, building synergies between NATO defense planning process and industry, and NATO's ongoing missions and operations from Kosovo to Iraq, the media headlines across the world have focused on the outcomes directly linked to the war in Ukraine. The ongoing implementation of deterrence and defense that were decided at the Madrid summit, Allies' continued support to Ukraine, as well as NATO's nuclear deterrence. And rightly so. There is a reason why our strategic concept defines Russia as the most significant and direct threat to our security. We are seeing a disturbing pattern of increasingly aggressive behavior where Russia seeks to establish spheres of influence. It aims to destabilize countries. It uses conventional cyber and hybrid means against NATO and its partners. The most recent and obvious example is the unprovoked war in Ukraine. Ukraine, a free and independent nation. We are witnessing a unprecedented level of destruction, violence, and displacement, reminiscent of Europe's darkest days of the, of the last century. When the rule of force eclipsed the rule of law, when illegal and illegitimate annexations of territory were common, when false ideology and narratives ruled, when the threat of nuclear war loomed over us. Generations of people fought and died to bring back the light, to protect our values, freedoms, and democracies. The Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian armed forces have been resisting bravely and fiercely, and they are turning the tide by pushing back the invaders making impressive and encouraging progress with the help of NATO allies and partners. Now, 50 nations are supporting Ukraine with lethal, non-lethal, and financial aid. But this is not the West against the rest. This is about the rules-based international order, which serves all sovereign nations in the world and should therefore be important to them. It was very telling that 143 nations at the United Nations General Assembly voted against Russia's annexation of Ukrainian territories. NATO allies have, as recently as two days ago, made clear that support will continue for as long as it takes. Winter is coming, but our support shall remain unwavering, just like our resolve to defend and protect the one billion people who live on Allied soil. This is a pivotal moment for global security. We're seeing a renewed commitment from NATO allies to meet the defense spending pledge of 2% of their GDP and 20% of their defense budget to be spent on investments. And we're witnessing a historically fast application for NATO membership of Finland and Sweden. Bringing Finland and Sweden into the fold strengthens NATO and even extends NATO's defensive shield to protect 96% of the EU's population. Our alliance will gain significant military expertise, not only with regard to personnel or capabilities, including an, enviably, an enviable technological edge, but also when it comes to readiness and resilience. 
There is also centuries worth of valuable knowledge and intelligence gathered from their close pro proximity to Russia, especially from Finland's joint border. With more than two decades of frequent joint military exercises, Finnish and Swedish armed forces are also highly compatible with NATO allies. And this provides a solid basis for the process of military integration. Finland and Sweden have the capability to maneuver and maintain operations in both Arctic conditions on land and at sea, as well as control the skies in the northern Baltic region. And of particular interest today, the accession of Finland and Sweden would also mean that seven of the eight members of the Arctic Council will be NATO members. Back in March, the Arctic Council momentarily suspended its activities for obvious reasons. But the seven remaining members have since resumed their coordination by sidelining Russia. For the simple reason that the interests and work in the Arctic region have not waned. As the obvious gateway to the North Atlantic, the Arctic has always had a strategic relevance for NATO. It hosts vital trade and communication links between North America and Europe. Unfortunately, the world is seeing increased competition and militarization in the region, especially from Russia and China. For Russia, this has meant making the Arctic and sub-Arctic serve militarily and operationally as a strategic bastion for its deterrence and defense, setting up an Arctic command to protect the forces of the Northern Fleet and serve its nuclear deterrent, launching a new naval strategy last month, pledging to protect Arctic waters by all means, including by increasing its activity around the non-militarized Norwegian archipelago, archipelago of Svalbard, as well as delivering hypersonic missiles to its northern fleet. But also by rebuilding and upgrading its Soviet-era military bases scattered throughout the Arctic. Russia is now investing heavily in the development of these remote sites, rebuilding airstrips, enlarging compounds, and setting up large-scale radar installations. But also using the region as testbed for novel weapons, deploying new coastal and air defense missile systems, as well as upgrading its submarines or unveiling plans for a new strategic ballistic missile submarine, the Arctur, designed for Arctic operations. But also by organizing more maneuvers, including live fire drills, more frequent submarine operations, electronic warfare, and simulated airstrikes against designated allied targets. For China, another authoritarian regime that does not share our values and undermines the rules-based international order, the Arctic interests mean defining itself as a near-Arctic state and building a more prominent presence, by leveraging new opportunities provided by the melting ice in the region, including a polar silk route, road linking China to Europe. By investing tens of billions of dollars in energy, infrastructure, and research projects in the region. By building the world's largest icebreaker and planning for more conventional heavy icebreakers, some of which are nuclear powered by embracing shortened distance and reaction times. Naval formations could move more quickly from the Pacific to the Atlantic and submarines could shelter in the Arctic if required. A matter of increasing concern is the growing cooperation between Beijing and Moscow. Beijing has yet to distance itself from Putin's war in Ukraine. Both countries are systematically amplifying divisions in the Western Balkans. And in their joint statement in February 2022, Beijing and Moscow pledged to intensify practical cooperation in the Arctic. Two authoritarian regimes 
that do not share our values or respect the rules-based international order, working together in an already fragile region with melting ice caps, rising sea levels, eroding coastlines, more frequent wildfires, and deteriorating ecosystems, with a clear disdain for properly addressing the climate change challenge. And that means that we cannot go about our business as usual. NATO must fulfill its inherent pledge of collective defense, one for all, all for one, and increase its presence in the high north. And this process is well underway. NATO has set up Joint Force Command Norfolk in the US to ensure that sea lines uh, across the Atlantic remain free. NATO and allies are conducting more and more Arctic and anti-submarine exercises in order to ensure our forces remain ready to operate in all conditions. Just last month, as part of exercise Arctic cooperation, NATO conducted an air operation partly over Norway's Nordland County with Norwegian, American, and Turkish fighter jets. Allies are also investing in new fighter planes, maritime surveillance aircraft, and vessels that are equipped to also operate in the Arctic region. For example, last week, the US issued the 10-year Arctic strategy that identifies four pillars, including an enhanced US military presence, increased exercises with partner countries to deter aggression in the Arctic. Norway announced that its 2023 national budget will have a special focus on its high north defense with more troops, capabilities, and higher presence. These are but a few examples of how NATO and allies are increasing our presence and vigilance across the alliance, including the high north. At the pivotal moment for global security, NATO will do what it has done best for the last 73 years, unite and adapt. With strength and unity, we will continue to deter aggression, protect our values and interests, and keep our people safe. And soon, with seven out of eight Arctic states being part of this great alliance, we will do everything we can to make sure the Arctic remains free and open. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Well, thank you, Admiral Bauer.